Good morning, God's people. Pray that your week has been blessed in the Lord. I know it has because you're here and you're in the kingdom and you are right with the Lord and you are determined to make heaven your home. So you're blessed. Brother Venera, I thank you so much. Uh, what you just shared to the assembly because that's vital, that's important. And I think he's, he's clarified what it is we want to achieve throughout the month of October. We want to bring our members not to a new understanding. Or for some, it's going to be new in the sense that uh, they have been baptized in Christ and never really have had a, uh, a rather uh, concentrated study on church membership. That's new members, and they need to be exposed to that in body life format. But for most of us, it's remedial learning that we have already come to understand. But Peter said to his recipients, this letter, that I'm writing uh, things that you remember, he says, that, that you already know. But I want to bring, as it were, to your remembrance. He says, I'll do this as long as I'm in this tabernacle. I'm going to be reiterating, reaffirming you in these truths. And he wrote that in the 60s A.D., he uh, only had a few years left, but I'm sure Peter kept to his word that he kept bringing the church back to the learning that they had already been exposed to. And that's what membership matters is all about. And I want to speak to that this morning. Membership matters. I want to do it in two facets. First, I want to speak about it from biblical perspective. I want to reaffirm uh, from a biblical, doctrinal, instructive, admonishing, exhorting, encouraging way that God's Word teaches us everything we need to know about membership. And when you put it all together, you come away with an understanding that membership matters in God's kingdom because it matters to God. And we have to grow up. The Bible says that we grow up in Christ. Meaning that when we start out, we don't have all of the knowledge, the gnosis, or the epic gnosis, the fullness of knowledge that we're going to have. Nobody really comes up out of the water really knowing at that moment the magnitude of church membership. Maybe they've got an inkling of it, and their first exposure is, is hands being reached out to shake and hugs being given and smiles. And, and yet that's just a small facet of what church membership is about. And over time, they come to understand what God understands. This thing matters. But the devil goes to work. We're fighting a, a battle. It's spiritual warfare. And, and if we're not careful, he begins to chip away at our understanding of 
what it is, church membership, and why it matters. So we need to bring the church together on occasions to be reaffirmed and reestablished into the God truth that no, no, what you did as we look at this verse and obey in Christ, you, you, you joined your life to where all of the divine action is. And having joined your life to that, God added you to his kingdom. You obey the gospel. The second part of this, um, I want to reaffirm what the program or the activities of membership matters at the Waterbury Church of Christ. Now, let's stand together for the reading of the word. Very familiar verse, you've heard it, you are a part of it. This is you, this is you at some point in the past. This was your reality. Praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord, not man, added to the church daily those who were being saved. Could you pray with me? Father God, Lord God Almighty, we are here under you, before you, with you, for you, Father, to worship you in spirit and truth. We appreciate so much the class that was taught this morning that spoke about worship in spirit and truth, and that's what we aim to do. That's what we've been doing every time the body meets here, and God, the day is nothing different. We need you, Father, to speak. Holy Spirit of God, speak into our hearts. Lord Jesus, rule and reign so that, Father, this moment will be everything it ought to be, everything it needs to be. And, Father, that we may come away being reaffirmed, those of us who are in body, those of us who are in Christ, on the role of heaven, not just the role of man, that membership matters in your kingdom, your church. I pray that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I say a word about this text? Can we just enter into the text just for a moment and, and understand what the Holy Spirit would have us to understand? First of all, this verse begins with the attitude or the mindset or the response to what God is going to do and is already doing in your life as a member of the body of Christ. It says that that deserves some praise. That is not a, a blase moment. That is not an indifferent moment. It is not an indifferent moment. It is not, well, you know. No, it's not that kind of moment. That, that the Bible says there was an atmosphere. There was an environment. There was a climate of praise because folks in the context of this verse were being saved and added to the body of Christ. Now, stop and think when God created man. That's, that's creation. He stepped back and said that that's good, super good. Everything God does is good. He didn't say uh, somehow it can become good in the by and by. He didn't say that, that maybe uh, some way it may work out to be good. When he created man in his own image and likeness, he stood back and blessed himself and said, that's good. But creation, 
creation, as good as it is, doesn't get into God's heaven. Stop and think about what I've just said. Creation. Just being born in the world. In him we live and move and have our very being. It's all from God, but just being a, a living person doesn't bring you into glory. It takes the new creation in Jesus to get you into God's place. And that ought to tell you just off the bat that membership matters. In fact, we ought to celebrate new biological life, and we do, with a lot of fanfare, a lot of activities, a lot of events, a lot of celebration, mother, uh, other types of affirmations to the father, to the family. But if we can do that in the natural, it ought to be on steroids, supercharged that we celebrate new life because it's the new life folks who are going to God's place and that deserves some praise. That's the climate. I think it's interesting that it says it's having favor with all the people. Uh, even if you understand that those even on the outside, I think on the inside, but even on the outside, that they did not disregard diminish what they were doing. I believe that uh, they probably said that, you know, some of your folks will say, that's a good thing that you found Jesus. I haven't yet. It's a good thing that you're in the body of Christ. I, 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 I'm not yet there, but, but I want to admire you. I want to let you know that's a good thing. So when you really understand that text, we are a growingly, increasingly secular society. But there are still some folks who have not lost their awareness even on the outside. Some are, some, some are at the beach. Some, some are doing their laundry. Some are washing their car. Some are doing other things. And I believe not all of them are not having thoughts. I really need to find Jesus. I really need to be worshiping God. I really need. Already the Spirit of God is planting into their, their mindset what he's planted into you. Because if any man comes to God, God invites, God initiates. And some of these folks in which they were having favor would be a part of the growth of the church in the days ahead. That we respect what you did. So we've got to Never, ever, oh, let me speak it to you. Give the world the impression that membership doesn't matter. That's a bad thing. That's not a good thing. We've got to let folks know that, listen, I'm in the world. I'm, I'm not, you know, worldly like I used to be, but I've got a life in the world. But my citizenship is in heaven. And I'd like to tell you how you can go there. Because I have discovered, didn't know it even when I, when I first found Jesus, that, that it does matter, I'm going to break it down in biblical context, that you are a member of God's church. The greatest institution on the face of the earth. God's church, God's people, bigger than anything better than anything, going to where God is. And man, if you go where God is, you know you are super bad, super good. Now, God at it. They didn't join the church of their choice. There was only one, actually. That, that's true. That's only one. historical facts. We don't have to rewrite, revise history. There was only one ecclesia. It grew according to the Great Commission, but they were only added to that one body in Jerusalem at that time. And then it grew 
Because you will be witnesses where in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. We're going to grow this thing, and it does grow. And Waterbury is simply living in the destiny of what God promised. We're just living in the destiny, in the destiny of what he promised on Pentecost. Isn't that awesome? That our roots go back to Pentecost, not some... Uh, well, can I say it? Can I say it without sounding uh, some kind of man-made institution or uh, organization? No, our roots go back to what Peter said on Pentecost. Now, now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. In biblical perspective, I want to talk about the program, the event, but let's let's just be reaffirmed from from a Bible-based perspective on why membership matters. First of all, I want to I focus on this word, redeemed, redeemed, and all of the importations and implications of that word, redemption. Everything that God promised, declared in the garden after the fall was redemptive language. But he's going to, he's going to, he's the seed of the woman. He's, he's going to uh, bruise your head. That's a death blow. Oh, you're going to bruise his heel. You're going you're gonna to make a fight of it, the devil. But he's going to give you a death blow on Calvary. He's going to win the victory for us. He's going to win the victory for the world. And so we are redeemed. And I want you to understand that church membership brings us into redemption. That's a big theological word, redemption. Basically, it just means to be forgiven. That's it. That's what redemption is. But it implies a price that was paid. It implies a debt that was owed. It implies that something had to be done to, to mitigate, to rectify the situation because we could not fix ourselves. We, we were messed up, jacked up. <laughs> and we could not pull ourselves up out of the bookstraps. And that's self-righteousness. That's a stench to the nostrils of God. So when we understand church membership, first of all, we understand it from this value, this value, the value is that we live in the redemption of the forgiving blood of Jesus. Oh, in him we have redemption through his blood. It's a repetitious, the forgiveness of sins. Now I want you to think back. Come on, I, I got it right before me. I want you to think back and, 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 and to that, you see, everybody has a baptismal date if they're in Jesus. If they have found the doctrine of salvation in its biblical truth, they have been baptized. We don't pray the sinner's prayer and get right with God, though we do pray. Paul was praying. But if Paul was saved before Ananias came and told him, why tarriest thou? Then, then there's a number of folks who didn't know it. First of all, God didn't know it because he said, Ananias, go tell him what he, got to do, what he needs to do. So God didn't know he was saved. That seems crazy right there. Secondly, Ananias didn't know because Ananias went to tell him what he must do. So Ananias didn't know it. And also Paul doesn't know it. That's a lot of not knowing. I take it that when he said to Paul, now why tarryest thou arise and be baptized? Paul said it, called him by the name, wash away your sins. That, that's, that's this word. So everybody that's been baptized can think back and think back to all sin debts were marked, paid in full for the remission of your sins. When Peter says for the remission of your sins, that's 3,000 folks had their books purged of any sin. That's deep. 3,000. 
Just right there on the spot. Just, just clean, purge. That alone lets you know that membership matters. When I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I pray sometimes, I know you do, we don't have to spend a lot of time in the past, but every once in a while, I, 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 maybe, maybe, I, I just, maybe I'm all by myself, but maybe not. I think about my pre-baptism days. Now, I was pretty young. It was young. We were young. But still, I was not right. I was not saved. And I think about even at that age, that age, 28 years old, that at 20, I had done enough stuff that God says, man, I love you, but not, not, I don't love you enough to bring you to heaven. You got to get that fixed. And you can pick your date. And at that moment, at that moment, the devil saw everything. You know, he said he accuses us before God night and day. You know that verse? He suddenly had his accusations shut down. Just gone, purged, just thinking back. That alone sometimes, I don't care how long that's been, deserves a tear, <laughs> some praise, some celebration, because some folks did some stuff, and, 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 and they got caught up in some stuff, and people come to Christ with all kinds of stuff. Paul named this notorious list and told the Corinthians that you did this stuff. This was some of you. Then we think presently. Now, now, all sins can be declared forgiven. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, 1 John 9. I've said it many, many times. You don't have to confess something wrong, something amiss, something bad something that's not where it ought to be every time you talk to man. But I'm going to tell you something. Get in the habit. Get some security with that. Get some assurance with that, that you can confess anything and everything when you pray to God. Just get up and say, God, 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 God. I did that thing yesterday. I didn't want to. I didn't plan to. But God, I did that. I thought that. And you know, when we talk about sins, we're not only talking about sins of, of oh, man, speak spirit, of cognition. We're talking about sins of omission. Not only stuff I did that I shouldn't do, the stuff I didn't do that I should have done. God says, I'm holding you th that too, man. Don't forget the omission stuff. The him that knoweth to do good and do it, but not is what? So you did miss prayer yesterday, man. You did miss your Bible reading, man. You, you did miss the opportunity to do good. You did miss the opportunity to, to, to worship me. You did miss an opportunity to be grateful. So when I come into his presence, I've got to lay that before the throne. That's in present time. That's membership stuff. And he promises me, man, I don't care what you feel. I don't care what the devil tells you. But when you get up, you're forgiven. Well, I'm faithful. You can go through a guilt trip for a month if you want to do that. But I, 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 I'm, I'm done. It. It's, I'm done. It's over. Then thinking eternally. Ah, this is where it really matters. Come on, let me speak it to you. All sins not remembered by his blood. I'm going to stand before God, my sister. <laughs> I just got to trust that he has a, he has not a short memory, but no memory but Jesus. All I need him to see is Jesus in me. All I need him to see is I'm washed in the blood. All I need him to see is that I am a child of God, redeemed by the blood. I don't even need him to see how many sermons I preached, because some of them weren't good. Ah, I don't even need him to remember how many prayers I prayed, because some of them went south. 
I don't even need to remember how many verses I read because sometimes I read it but didn't live it. Oh, God, I plead the blood. I plead Jesus Christ. That's all I need you to see. That's why the Bible says that, that he, he is our life. Our life is what he had in him. Oh, I want to get behind Jesus. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, I want to move. But Jesus, move. I'm going to stay behind him. He is the forerunner. He is the pace setter. I want to stay right behind him and say, Lord, Jesus, save me. Hold me. Redeem me. And when I stand before God, speak about me. That's what membership means. That's membership. He lives to make intercession for us. Isn't that great? His work is not even down on the cross. He's praying for me right now. I believe Jesus is praying for my sermon right now. And Lord, I need it. I believe he's interceding for you. Your song service, he prayed for. Your announcement he prayed for. He loves to make intercession for us. Now, now listen to this. Listen to this now. We not only live in the redemption of the blood of Jesus, we live in the redemption. This is membership of being God's spiritual and specially owned people, his ownership. The Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, notice he says, until the redemption of the purpose, for, when God brings it all together and says, okay, you in, the redemption of the blood. Now let's break this down. Owned. Everything you own in time will diminish in value. It will. In this time side of life, in this time side of life, it will it will not increase but decrease. I know you can make an economic thing about uh, your home and uh, whatever and, and 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 other kinds of cars, but no, no. In time, in time, it all diminishes. In fact, in fact, when Jesus comes, it ain't gonna be worth anything. It's gonna diminish in value. Now, but Jesus says, listen. What I own increases in value. It never loses its value. It stays valuable. So when I'm owned as a member of God's church, we live every day in his covenant promises. Now, I often have to remind myself and tell people that God only does covenant relationships. God don't date. He doesn't. He don't, he don't just hang out with folks. So let's just, you know, let's just hang out and kick it around a little bit. No, God says, I only do covenant because I want to show you what, what you can believe about me. And I want to know what I can believe about you. Covenant. So we live in the covenant promises of God right now. There's a promise on my life. There's a promise over your life. I don't care what you're going through. God has promised. If it's good, God says he done it. If it's bad, he's going to work it for good. It's all good. Now, we live every day in his answered prayers. Now, I was thinking about this in the office this week and thinking about sometimes we say to each other, uh, parents will say to children, you're living in my prayers. But actually, actually, I'm going to tell you something. We can run with that. Uh, we can go with that. But the truth of the matter is the power is just not in what prayer you may be living in, but what prayer is answered. That's a difference. And so it's God's part to answer the prayer. So I live in the covenant promise of an answered prayer that I can get a prayer through when I need it. You prayed your way through this, this winter. You prayed your way through that. You prayed your way to something better. You prayed your way to, to, to a health issue, and God blessed it. You prayed your way to a, a, a renewed walk with God. And not only that, because we're owned, we live in the provisions of God. Don't take it for granted. Don't you think that it's your job and your savings account 
and your, your credit cards that makes, no, no, no. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times because he is the one who blesses me. He is the one that, that butters my bread. In fact, he is the one that gives me bread, but not only gives me bread, money can buy food, but it can't buy you an appetite. He is the one that gives you the appetite. He is the one that makes the, the body work so that even what you digest keeps you alive and sustained. It's all of God. And God says to those who are outside of his kingdom, you live under my love, but you do not live under my promises and my guarantees to answer prayer. I don't promise you that. I don't promise you provisions. And I don't even promise protection. I don't want to say something about protection. Because sometimes Christians say, well, I've studied protection. And how does this job with the doctor's prognosis? How does this provide with that break in? How did that provide with that robbery, that loss of life? God promises you, here it is, eternal protection. That's, that's the guaranteed protection. Oh, he'll bless you, uh, you know, in time, but it's the eternal protection that he, he, he promises you. Now, now listen to this. Thirdly and lastly on redemption, we live as members of the church in the redemption of a new spiritual understanding of time. That's valuable. Ben Franklin says, don't waste time for such is the stuff that life is made out of. Your greatest commodity facing eternity is that dash between your birth and your exit. That little dash. That dash. You know that little dash. You know what I mean? And you look at that. Have you ever looked at somebody and, and you see the little dash and there's an other side? You know, and, and you're looking at it because you're still alive, right? <laughs> you see birth and death. But, but, but sometimes you don't see the exit date. You see birth and dash. Dash is important. Because that's God's time to say, let me do what I need to do in your life. Because eternity is coming. Don't push me off. Don't diss me. Don't reject me. Don't cast me down. Don't throw me under the bus because time is going to end, not only in Jesus, but for you. So we have a new understanding of time. See then that you walk circumspectly, that word cautiously, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because today, redeem the time. So two things I want you to understand about time as members of God's church. He's given you a new mind. I told you, I told you, it would be a good time to remind you about a, a man that was visiting church with his wife. It's a true story. <laughs> One of the brothers asked him for a Bible study. Hey, did man, you, you know, listen, you, you, you're here at church, but you know, can I just study Bible? And, and really, I, I'm telling you, God, now I'm in with it. He pulled out his little pocket calendar, and he slow walked through every, I mean, I'm telling you, Nick, I, I, I'm not hating, my sins are worse, but he slow walked, uh, you know, July, August, he slow walked. September, October, he slow walked it, Angie. And then he closed and said, I ain't got the time. Wow. Man, that's scary stuff. That's ear throbbing stuff, you know. But let me tell you something here. It's not our mindset. As members of the church, God graciously saved us before we departed from time. We, we could have left. We could have been gone before we even knew Jesus. So I remember my 12th grade year. I remember that the whole celebratory atmosphere was, was shook to its bone because we had two deaths that year of 12th graders. Two. Both were tragic. 
a lot of years since the 12th grade. They're gone. One was coming in late with his friends. He's in my yearbook. And his father, this is a true story, accidentally took him for a, bur for a burglary. He was shot dead. That's true. He died holding his son. That's how that is. His son died in his arms. He loved his son accidentally. God, I don't understand that. I don't get that. I, I, I don't get that. That's beyond my pay grade. I don't know he stood with Jesus. He was of age. He was a, a age. He was a cannibal. Some of you have been baptized with that age. But he, he, he died. That bullet went into his chest. And the devil said, I, I got that for you. But God says, no. The second is, you know, Roderick did die. Because they did go on that field trip to Big Ridge Park. And he did get caught into the waters. And the guy who was trying to save him said the last thing that stuck with his mind to see Roger's body drifting away. He was gone. But God says, not you. I saved you in time. Don't ever forget that. Don't take that for granted. There are people who are going to die before the day is over. Do a death, Google search on the death clock. How many people die every minute, every second, every day? And yet you're saved. They're not saved. Secondly, is God gave us beauty for ashes. When we experience some bad moments in time, isn't it amazing? He has made everything beautiful in his time. You've gone through some stuff that is so hard, so ugly, so gruesome, so painful, so shameful, so hurtful. You did not think you would make it, and God turned it around. Isn't that what he did? Beauty for ashes. He reshaped that. He remolded that. He brought you through it. You're wiser, stronger, bigger, and better because of it. So here it is. Here it is. Not only membership matters because we are redeemed, but we are renamed. I want you to catch this. Think about the old names. It's been a long time since some of us have been in Christ, but, but we have some old names. I just wrote some down. Uh, it's been a long time since... No, since heaven called you a sinner. <laughs> uh, that's right. You know, I'm not talking about folks. <laughs> a, a transgressor, a lost person, unsaved, condemned. Oh, can I say it? Hades bound. That was my name outside of Jesus. He says without Christ, alien, stranger, having no hope without God. But there it is, to him who overcomes, beginning in baptism of waters, I will give a new name. So we got this name change. Look at it, Angie. Elect. It's got an election coming up right now, right? I'm already elect. I've been elected, you know. I, I've been voted in, not voted out. From heaven's sake, friends and heirs and saints, and beloved children of God, holy priests, lights, peculiar people, solidarity of sheep, believers, ambassadors, citizens of heaven, and family of God. And that's just a small portion of the list. Membership matters. So I want to close with this. Membership, what is it? It's four weeks on Sunday morning for our members to meet together study together, learn together, pray together, discuss together, and grow together in God's purpose for the membership of his church. God has a purpose. It's bigger than what preachers can envision and what elders can oversee. He has a purpose. And it's an up-close and personal small group format. We want to put you in small groups, six, seven, eight, nine, so we can really spend 45 minutes before we opening up, talking, sharing, learning more about each other, 
There are people in this church you don't know as you should. You know that. And I'm new here. But I don't think I'm inaccurate. Because we get so comfortable, don't we? I got to close. My brother dropped by the office this week and said something to me very interesting. I told him I'd mention it. He said, man, you know what? He said, Brother Van, even when we go through this membership matters, you know how we get comfortable? He said, you just ask people for four weeks to sit in a different seat. They said, what you talking about, man? You know, Willis, what you talking about, brother? What you talking about, Willis? Well, you know, sometimes you got to sit next to somebody that you don't really know and say, hey, how are you? I don't know that person. You get so comfortable, you know, so in my space. I think that's a good idea. Abraham, I mean, Andy Murray was an idea. I think that's a good idea. And it's about right learning and right living and right labor. We're going to focus on relationships, responsibilities, and restorations. Relationships, responsibilities, and restorations. I've seen the material. That's good material. And have group leaders going to talk about relationship. And what we want at the end of that is those groups to give a report so that uh, the elders, evangelists, deacons, we can look over that, pace setters, and really say, okay, we know this inch, we know where to scratch the itch now. Because you're telling us how to fix some things. So here it is as we close. Why do you need to be in it? Just, just two reasons. Just two. sacrificing for the month of October to say, okay, I, maybe not normally, but okay, I'm going to come out to Bible class in one of these groups because God is going to show up and participate. You ought to be here. I, I want to be where God is. I, I do, I do, I do. I, I, I want to be where God is. I only told you want to follow Jesus. No, no, the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, all three, I think all three are going to be here. I believe they're going to show up and bless this thing. I believe it. They're going to bless it. And I don't want to be, I don't want to be home when, when, when the action is. And then secondly, your fellow family members in Christ is going to show up and participate. Family members. We're part of the family. And we need you. We need you in this church. You're part of the family. We need you in one of those groups to talk to other family members about how we can get our relationships stronger, how we can get more people in a responsibility mode of what my ministry is, what my calling is, and even how we can reach out to people who need to be restored. And everybody that needs to be restored ain't gone. Sometimes I'm right here and I need to be restored in my faith, restored in my prayer life, restored in my walk with God. So that's my sermon. I pray that you're going to help this thing be special and spectacular. My brother is going to come back and lead us in invitation. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Or come for prayer. Whatever the need, let's stand right now and do that.